Welcome to Meeple Mentor. I'm Jared, and we're about to play Carcassonne. Let's take a look. I'll show you how. Feel free to pause the video as needed to follow along with your copy of the game. My goal is this video can not only teach you to play, but can be shown at the game table to help set up and teach the game at your next game session. As part of that goal, I've added chapter timestamps in the description to the different sections of the tutorial to easily recap relevant rules for you. I'll be teaching the base game with several expansions included in the Carcassonne Big Box 5 edition. That includes the river, traders and builders, inns and cathedrals, hills and sheep, and the wheel of fate. This tutorial is brought to you in cooperation with Luck Factory Games out of Concord, North Carolina. Make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell below the video so you don't miss any of my latest content. Carcassonne came to the U.S. five years after Settlers of Catan as one of the early Euro games to really shape and jumpstart the modern board gaming industry today. In fact, the popular term meeple originated from Carcassonne and it's come to be associated with any player's wooden pieces on the game board. The shape of the meeple is recognized and used in countless games since this, as well as the use of the term meeple. The meeple itself has a very interesting story behind it, which I encourage you to look up. In the game of Carcassonne, players will be earning victory points by completing roads, cities, monasteries, and meadows in the French city of Carcassonne. The landscape will develop as the game progresses each turn, with players adding new tiles to the expanding map. Once all the tiles are used, final scoring takes place, and whoever has the most points wins. Let's take a look at how to set it up. There are two primary ways of setting up the game, depending on whether or not you're including the river mini expansion. If you have it, I recommend using it even on your first play. First though, let's start with the basics. You should find among the landscape tiles the single dark back tile that indicates that's the starting tile to use. Place it face up in the center of the table. Flip all the rest of the landscape tiles face down and shuffle them together. Create stacks of these for players to draw from. You can make one stack or several. It doesn't really matter as long as they were shuffled up well. Take out the colored wooden meeple pieces and let players choose a color to be. All players should have eight meeples in their color in front of them. Any unused colors can return to the game box. Set the scoring board to the side of the table along with the eight point tiles with 50 and 100 sides. These won't be needed until scoring later. Each player should place one of their meeples at zero on the scoring board. This meeple will be their scoring token used throughout the game to keep track of your points. As points are earned, just move your meeple forward the number of scored points. The youngest player at the table will be the first player to go, with turns going clockwise from there until the game's end. At this point, you're ready to play unless you wanted to use the river expansion to start. To do that, find the beginning and end river tiles among the 12 river landscape tiles. Shuffle the middle 10 river tiles into a single face down stack, with the lake ending tile placed at the very bottom and the source tile at the very top, completing the 12 tile river stack. The first player will place the source tile as the first tile of the game face up in the middle of the table instead of the base game starting tile with the dark background. The difference of gameplay and using the river tiles is that players must draw from the river stack each turn until the river is completed. The river itself doesn't score points, but the features on and around the river still can. While building out the river, each new river tile must extend the river to be continuous. Since some river pieces have a bend, players may not turn the river's direction twice in a row the same direction. This could risk the river looping into itself, and is not allowed. When the river is done, players can take a landscape tile from any face down stack on future turns. Players will take turns in clockwise order until all the landscape tiles are played. Note that the more expansions you include, the more tiles you'll have mixed in to play with, so expect a longer game for each added expansion. After the final turn, each player will get to score the final meeples they still have on the map. Usually this is at a reduced point value for not completing the feature. 
Finally, whoever has scored the most points wins. On your turn, you must draw a single landscape tile from the stacks. The tile must be added to the map in a way that extends the existing map. All players will be contributing tiles one at a time to the same single map. Everything must connect to at least one side of a tile already on the table. Additionally, the features shown on the tile must line up so like matches like, road matches to roads, grass to grass, cities to cities, etc. After placing your tile in a valid spot, you may place one of your available meeples onto the tile just played to attempt to score a feature. In the base game, it could be roads, cities, monasteries, or the fields. No matter how many features are on the tile, you may only add one of your meeples to it to claim something. You don't ever have to place a meeple. Next, any city, road, monastery, or other feature that has just been completed will be scored, no matter who has meeples on it. Scoring happens at the end of the player's turn and for each completed feature. Note that to be considered connected, the tiles must share a side. Diagonals are not connected to each other directly. After completing a feature and scoring it, the meeples return to their owner's supplies. Ties are friendly. All tied players earn the full points. However, if one player has majority, they earn all the points. Then the next player goes. If nothing was completed, then play moves on to the next player without scoring anything. By placing your meeple on a road, shown on a tile, they are considered to be highwaymen. However, if the tile you placed connects to an existing road that has another player's highwayman, you may not place a highwayman on that road. It's already been claimed. A road continues until it has a start and end point, usually at villages, cities, and monasteries. However, it could also be looped onto itself thereby completing it as well. With the road or roads closed, they are immediately scored for every player who has highwaymen on them. Each tile that makes up part of the road will count as one point. So this road will score red three points. The red player should immediately move their scoring meeple forward three on the score track. Should your newly placed tile connect a road so two players now both have highwaymen on it, they'll both be vying for control of it. The only way to compete on roads and cities is to claim control of a new city or road first, then connect them later. Points are awarded evenly when players are tied. Otherwise, whoever has the most meeples on the road or city when it's completed will have majority control and score all the points. The concept of majority control is important as it's a strategic part of the game, deciding where you'll try to start and later connect to the different tile features. By placing your meeple on a part of a new city on your tile, it becomes a knight. The city side of the tile can connect to other city tiles or empty space. If connecting to other city tiles, you may only place a knight on it if other players don't have a knight in that city yet. In fact, if you also already have a knight on the city where the tile connects to it, you can't add a new one this turn. Just like the roads, the only way to add more meeples to a city already claimed is to first claim a separate city and later merge them. When a tile merges two or more players' occupied cities, they are now competing for control. Remember that the city won't score until it's completed. Cities connect along a side and can close off at the points. So in this example, blue and red have separate cities at the moment because diagonal tiles don't connect. A city is complete once it's surrounded by walls with no gaps inside the city. Each tile that contributes at least one part of the completed city is worth two points. Additionally, each coat of arms icon shown in the completed city scores two points. In this example, the red player places a tile to complete the cities, which connects her other city. Now red has majority ownership and gets 12 points. A monastery can only be occupied by one person's meeple. When laying the tile, you can choose to claim it and try to score it by putting your meeple on it. These are known as monks. The monk will stay there until the monastery scores or the game ends, just like other features. The way a monastery scores during the game is when its tile is completely surrounded at all edges and diagonals. It must be surrounded by eight landscape tiles, regardless of how they connect. As soon as the eighth tile is placed, the player's monk scores them nine points, a point for the monastery and each tile around it. The last type of feature on landscape tiles that can be scored are the fields. The rulebook recommends not using the scoring method in your first game, but you're always welcome to. A field is any connected grassy area separated by roads and cities. A field could be very small or encompass a huge area of the map. 
Remember that to be connected, they must share a side. Touching only at the points does not count, and therefore you still have multiple fields. Field scoring is unique in that they are only scored at the end of the game. There's never a time when the field is considered complete, even if fully surrounded. When placing a tile on your turn, you may choose to claim an empty field spot on it as long as no one else has claimed the connecting field made by its location. The meeple used will be known as a farmer and is laid on its back. These lay down to help remind players to never pick them up until the end of the game. Fields may end up having multiple farmers through the same method as roads and cities. The farmer must first be in his own field, then later connect to another field when a new tile is placed later. In this way, you can have more of your farmers in a single field to help you have majority or to tie and gain full points along with another player. The points earned for a field are determined by adjacent completed cities, no matter how large they are. I'll cover this in more detail next when I go over the end of the game. The end of the game is triggered at the end of the turn where the last landscape tile was placed. Then you can proceed to final scoring. Cities, roads, monasteries, and fields will all score points for players with meeples on them. If using expansions in your game, some of those offer new features that will also score. It's best to do one feature type at a time across the whole map, removing the meeples as you go. When scoring something that has more than one player's meeples on it, check if someone has the majority. That player alone scores the full points. Otherwise, any tied players for the most each score the full points. First, look at any roads that have highwaymen on them. Each tile that has a part of that road will score one point. Each city that still has knights on it, because it wasn't completed, will score one point per tile. Each tile that contributes at least a part of the city will count as one point. Also, each coat of arms in the city will score one point. Now look at any monks at monasteries. These score one point for the monastery, plus one point for each surrounding tile. Monasteries still give you the points like this at game end, even though they didn't get fully surrounded. Finally, you'll look at each field that has at least one farmer in it. Remember, a field is separated by city walls, roads, and corners. Any completed city adjacent and touching the field will score the field three points. The smallest city possible is two tiles, and definitely counts as three points for the touching fields. The size of the field does not matter for points, it's only about how many completed cities touch that field. A completed city can contribute and score for multiple fields. The larger a field is, the more likely other players also have a farmer in it, so be sure to check everywhere the field goes. Tied farmers score full points, while the majority player of farmers will be the only one to score the points. One question I often hear when scoring fields for the first time is how do the monasteries separate fields? Well, some monasteries are surrounded by fields on all sides, so they extend a field. Other monasteries have a single road coming out from them. For those, there's also only one field since the grass can be traced from the left to the right side by going around the monastery building. Expansions can offer other monastery varieties. After all scoring has completed, check everyone's total scores. Whoever has the most points wins the game. Carcassonne has been around for a long time and has seen many expansions. Each one can be added to your game with any others. You could put them all in at once for a very long and high scoring game. I'll cover some of them that I own, but there are plenty more you can find and use. Some expansions don't change the gameplay too much and are considered mini expansions. The river is a good and popular example. I already explained how the river works in the setup as that's the only change it offers. As a reminder, players can't place meeples on the river. It doesn't score points. However, any feature on the river tiles could be claimed. The Inns and Cathedrals expansion adds large meeples, six inn tiles, two cathedrals, and 10 more landscape tiles. Including it adds about 15 minutes to the overall game length. Shuffle in all the new tiles to the shared stacks. Give each player one large meeple to their supply. It will be your only large meeple, bigger than any of your others. When you use this meeple on your turn, it follows the same normal placement rules and can become anything. The only difference is that it will be worth two normal meeples for purposes of determining who has control. After scoring a feature with the large meeple, it returns to you like any other does. The large meeple can be used as a farmer in a field as well, which means it will lay down there for the rest of the game. 
it will count as two towards controlling that field. The new landscape tiles that have ends will have this image with a little pond next to the end. These are always found next to a road. When an end is along the road, the player scores two points per road tile when it completes during the game. At the end of the game, however, no points are awarded for roads with ends on them. Normally, you would get one point per road if incomplete, but if there's an end, it won't score. The Cathedral City tiles have city terrain along each side. If you can complete the city with a cathedral in it, you'll score three points per tile and three points per coat of arms within that city. If the city contained both cathedrals, it doesn't stack. At the end of the game, any cities that have a cathedral that are incomplete don't score points for players. The presence of the cathedral prevents it from scoring anything. There are some clarifications on a few of the new tiles. This tile has four different city segments and one field in the middle. You are allowed to claim the field or one of the cities. There is a T crossroads with an N on it. The N counts for the road heading left and right, but not the one going down. The city tile that goes into a point will be an ending possibility of fields, such as in this example. The monastery tile here has two different roads coming out of it. It's not one. Lastly, when you see these very small road segments from a city, players cannot place highwaymen to score it, only the ones extending out the sides of the tile. The Traders and Builders expansion adds 24 landscape tiles, pigs, builders, and goods tokens to the game. Including it in your game adds about 15 minutes. Shuffle the new tiles into the rest and stack them like normal. Set the goods tokens to the side as a general supply. Each player should take one pig and builder in their color to their personal supply. You may place your builder on the tile instead of one of your meeples. It can only be added to a road or city that you already have at least one normal meeple on. The builder will get to return to your supply when the feature is scored or otherwise have your meeple return to you. Some expansions can have this happen. If you place a tile that extends the road or city that your builder is on, you may immediately draw and place another tile anywhere on the map. It basically gives you an extra turn. Note that you can't do that twice in a row on the same turn if you use the new tile drawn to extend the road or city again. When placing your first and second tile of your double turn, you may add a meeple on each like a normal turn, claiming a feature follow the normal placement rules. When the builder is still on the road or city, you can keep getting these double turns when extending it turn after turn. Multiple players' builders can occupy the same feature, but only the owner gets the benefit. Lastly, builders never count when determining control and ownership of a feature. Only meeples count. The pig piece can be placed on your turn instead of a meeple, but may only occupy a field where you already have a farmer. You are allowed to place your pig in a field, even if another player already has theirs in it. If your pig is removed, it returns to your supply, though generally this doesn't happen. Typically, your pig stays in that field until final scoring, like the farmers. If you control its field at the end of the game, you can score more points from that field with your pig there. Pigs, like builders, do not count towards control of a field. When scoring the field with your pig that you control, each completed city scores you four points instead of three. Other players' pigs don't affect your score. If you tie for control of the field with your pig, it increases your score, but not for the opponent. Lastly, from this expansion, you'll find the good symbols on certain city tiles. These are additional ways to earn points at the end of the game. Whenever a player places a tile that completes a city with goods tokens in it, that player gets the goods bonus. The city still scores points as normal for those with knight or knights in it. The player who completed the city does not have to have knights in the city, nor does anyone have to have them to gain the goods bonus. For each goods icon shown in each tile of the completed city, the current player gains a goods token that matches from the supply. Keep your collected goods tokens in front of you face up for everyone to see. At the end of the game, each type of good will score 10 points for the players who have the most. There's wine, grain, and cloth. In cases of ties, the tied players both score the 10 points. Score each type one at a time. The Hills and Sheep expansion adds 18 new landscape tiles, a cloth bag, shepherds, and 18 sheep tokens. Including this expansion adds about 10 minutes to your gameplay time. Shuffle in the new tiles with the rest during setup, then place all the sheep and wolf tokens in the bag. Give each player a shepherd piece in their color. To use the shepherd, you can choose to place it instead of one of your meeples on your turn on the tile you lay. 
The shepherd can only occupy a field. After placing it, draw one token from the bag. If it's a sheep token, put it sheep side face up next to your shepherd in the field. Should you draw a wolf token, return it to the bag and return your shepherd to your supply. The shepherd is a special figure, not a meeple, and does not count towards field control. Shepherds can be placed in fields even if there's a farmer in that field, but not if there's already a shepherd there. Only one shepherd per field. When placing a tile that expands the field with your shepherd, you'll also do one of two actions. You can grow the flock by drawing another token from the bag, or guide the flock to the stable to score the sheep. Should you choose to grow the flock, then draw a sheep token, place it in the field with the others next to your shepherd. But if you draw a wolf token from the bag, your flock scatters. All the sheep tokens in the field return to the bag and your shepherd comes back to your supply. By choosing to guide the flock to the stable, you'll gain points for each sheep pictured on the tokens. Count all the sheep pictured and score that on the score track. Then return the sheep tokens to the bag and return your shepherd to your supply. Sometimes separate fields with player shepherds can end up getting combined into the same field after a tile placed merges them. From then on, when a sheep token is drawn, the token is added to the field like normal. But when a wolf token is drawn, all the sheep are returned to the bag and each player takes their shepherd back. When a player decides to guide the flock to the stable, all sheep tokens score their sheep for each shepherd. Think of it as their flock combined together and score for both. Shepherds and sheep in fields at the end of the game don't score anything. The other new aspect of this expansion is the hills found on some new landscape tiles. When drawing a tile with a hill shown, immediately take another face down tile and place it under the hill tile without looking at it. Place the hill tile on the map like normal, but with the extra hidden tile underneath it. Hills themselves aren't something that can be claimed, but instead help break ties in your favor. If you have a meeple placed on a tile with a hill, the feature you've claimed will tie in your favor. It could be a road, city, or field claimed on it. It doesn't give you extra points and only matters if you tie for it. Only you would gain the points in that case. The hill tiles with meeples will break ties during final scoring as well. Lastly, you'll find some tiles with vineyards printed on the fields. Place these tiles on the map like normal with meeple placement like normal. The vineyards can't be claimed directly. Vineyards only score points for monasteries that are completed during the game. Each vineyard tile that surrounds the monastery will score that player three points per vineyard. A single vineyard tile can score points for multiple monasteries. At the end of the game, vineyards offer no extra points. The last expansion I'll teach you in this video is the Wheel of Fate. Including this expansion adds 20 minutes to your game time. First, set up the Wheel of Fate on the table with the pink pig token on the outside edge of the segment labeled Fortuna. The Wheel of Fate is the starting point of the map, so you cannot combine it with the river expansion. Additionally, remove the base game starting tile since it's marked with the dark background. All features on the Wheel of Fate tile can be linked to other map tiles. There are new landscape tiles to shuffle in with the rest of the landscape tiles that you're using in your game. During the game, if a player places a tile and chooses not to place a meeple on it, they may instead choose to add a meeple to the Wheel of Fate. The meeple can be placed on any open crown space on the outer wheel. Each crown section can hold only one meeple at a time. When one of the Wheel of Fate special tiles is drawn, the appropriate action is immediately taken. These have a one, two, or three printed on them. First, move the pig clockwise around the wheel the number of spaces shown on the tile. The wheel has six possible spaces for the pig to occupy. Each space has a different action associated with it. Only the final space the pig lands on will be the action the player takes. Additionally, the special fortune action only affects the current player. The fortune action is done before placing the newly drawn tile. The other five affect all players. Landing the pig on the fortune action lets the current player gain three points immediately on the scoreboard. The taxes action gives points to all players with knights in cities. For each city a player has knights, add together their knights and banners within that city. Then multiply that by the number of knights. So in this city where a player has two knights and there are two banners, they score eight points. The famine action gives points to players for each of their farmers. For each farmer, gain one point per completed city touching his field. 
you don't need to worry about having control of the field to score it. The storm action space gives players one point for each of their standard meeples still in their supply. This will include the larger meeple too, if using the inns and cathedral expansion. The inquisition action space gives players two points for each monk that they have on the map. These are your meeples that are standing on monasteries. The final space is pestilence and is the only negative action on the board. Starting with the current player, each player in clockwise order must remove one meeple from a landscape tile back to their supply. This does not include special pieces like builders, shepherds, or pigs. Players are not allowed to remove one of their meeples from the wheel as part of this action. After resolving the wheel's action space, the meeples occupying the crown spaces where the pig ended its movement will get points. If one meeple is there alone in a wheel segment that only has one crown space, they earn three points. If a meeple is alone in a segment with two crown spaces, they'll earn all six points. Should both crown spaces be occupied, the owners each get three points. If both meeples are owned by the same player, they'll gain six points. After scoring the segment, players return these meeples to their supply. At the end of the game, any remaining meeples on the wheel do not earn any points. This resolves the immediate Wheel of Fate process, so the current player should continue with the rest of their turn. They should place the tile on the map and can choose to place a meeple on a feature as normal if they wish. Also, they may choose not to place a meeple on the tile, but go ahead and put one onto the wheel. After all, the wheel has already been resolved this turn. Keep the rulebook handy and check BoardGameGeek.com for FAQs and extra content. The Meeple Mentor channel is now part of the board game community, The Gateway Network, made up of great upcoming board game content creators. The network includes Instagrammers, podcasters, YouTubers, artists, and more. Head to thegatewaynetwork.com to support new and independent board gamers. Also, I want to quickly shout out the excellent board game cafe in Concord, North Carolina, Luck Factory Games. Whether you're an avid player developing your hobby or looking to recapture the nostalgia of a game you played long ago, there's something for you in their expansive library of more than a thousand games. Through hosting events and having game teacher volunteers, they're all about promoting diversity and inclusivity to grow the hobby. Thank you for watching this tutorial. Like and subscribe if you found this teaching helpful. Stick around to watch another Learn to Play video. And remember, teach when you can, but always be learning. See you next time.